vector calculus. So this is kind of like an extension of the kinematics and all the stuff we've learnt to the universe of vectors. So essentially what we think of as vector calculus, it's not much more complicated than vectors. Essentially the only thing we're adding onto the idea of vectors is that instead of having numbers for each of the positions of the each of the planes, we just now have equations instead which means that we can do a lot more with them so we're talking about motion in this plane this plane and that plane so there's a couple different things that they can ask us to do with this obviously they can ask us to do all the kinematics motion stuff they can also ask us to do things about sketching pathways so in order to con convey a vector equation into a cartesian equation and this will normally be done if it only has i and j components because we don't really work with 3d stuff very much so all you have to do is essentially convert this so you make this equivalent to x and this equivalent to y and then you make them equal and then there'll be a parameter you work with the parametric equations manipulate them so you're able to get y in terms of x or at least like in a form which is a relation the type of relation that you know and then once you do that, essentially all you need to do after that is just tidy it up and make it nice so that you can look at that. And then there will be normally a domain and a range for the parameter involved in it. So normally t, they might say t is between 0 and 20 or something like that. And by doing that, you just have to sub it into ch to the x and the y equations to figure out what the domain and range is. And then you can just draw whatever it is and make sure to state the direction of motion and how you can test the direction the direction of the motion is essentially just like if you just go sub in t equals to what zero and then t equals to one or t equals to two just sub in easy values and that will show you which direction it's kind of moving in so the main things that they kind of assess you on is like the particles motion the shape and then the starting direction and place so and then also the period as well because often it's like pi or something in terms of sometimes they're like circular functions which means that period is important um, and so yeah you you normally if they ask you graph it they'll say state the direction of motion and state the starting point and you can just write that in cool so for something like this sketch the pathway defined by the following vector function identify the starting position and direction of motion so like i said normally they'll ask for what they want so we make this one equivalent to x and this one equivalent to y so we'll have x will equal to 2 sine t and y will equal to 3 cos t and why we make that first one equivalent to x and the second one equivalent to y is because i corresponds to the horizontal plane and generally our x corresponds to our horizontal plane and our j corresponds to the vertical plane and generally our j like our vertical plane corresponds to our y so that's why we have that so this one you might be familiar with in terms of finding a parametric equation and converting this into a Cartesian equation. So all you need to do is utilize the sine squared plus cos squared equals to one here. So what we're gonna say is sine theta is gonna to equal to x over two and cos theta is going to equal to y on three. So what that means for us is we can just go x squared over four plus y squared over nine is going to equal to one. And that's going to be our equation. So what we know is it's going to look a bit like an oblong potato. So it's going to go from 2 to negative 2 and from 3 to negative 3. So you can watch me draw this oblong. Hopefully your oblong looks a bit better than mine. Sorry, it looks a bit potatoey, But it goes from 2 to negative 2 and negative 3 to 3. And then we want to also test the direction of motion. So we probably shouldn't have drawn it out yet. But we just want to test whether it's 0 to pi. So if we think of what 2 sine theta is going to look like in terms of our equation so remember your sine theta graph your theta theta graph is like this right so it's kind of going to go like that and it's going to come from 2 and negative 2 so up here is going to be pi on 2 so down here is going to be pi so it's only actually going to be this half of the graph so therefore we're going to actually say that it's going to be from 0 to 2 so I'm just going to rub out my oblong and redraw it because we need to fix up the domain and range. So we figure out that it's actually only between 0 and 2. So it's going to go up to here, which is 2. And then in terms of our cos graph, our cos graph, remember, it looks something like this. So it kind of hits the peak and then it goes to like this down here. So 
this is pi and 2, this is pi. So if we check what's going to be going on here, it's 0 to pi. So it's this section here. So we can check that's going to be from 3 to negative 3. So our y graph is going to still be from 3 to negative 3. So it's going to look like this, like a semi, semi oblong or a semi ellipse. And then we can draw out our starting position now. So if we substitute 0 into there, sine 0 is going to equal to 0. So essentially it's going to end up that it's going to be here. So sine 0 is going to be along here. So the x coordinate is going to be 0. And then the y coordinate, if we sub 0 into there, so cos 0 is going to equal to 1. So this is going to be our starting point. So 0, 3, starting point. And we can kind of guess the direction of motion from here. It's not evidently not going to go that way. So it has to go this way. But we can do a quick check. So if we sub in pi on 2 into here, sine pi on 2 is going to equal to 1. So it's going to end up here. I mean, sorry, 1 times 2. So it's going to end up here. And then cos pi on 2 is going to equal to 0. So that's 0. So we know that it's going to end up here. So we can kind of draw that as the direction of motion. Amazing. So in terms of these are our kind of things that we look for. So just like we looked for displacement and distance in kinematics, we can do the same for vectors. So if we're looking for distance, we can kind of do this one, which essentially kind of looks like the length of curve graph, length of curve equation, and is essentially the length of curve equation if you have a bit of a squeeze at what's going on. So you're just looking at the arc length or the total area under that graph. So that's kind of what you can get there. If you're looking at the distance between two points, it's just R1 minus R2. And the direction of motion is going to be given. So, so here, when they ask you to label the direction of motion, it's like an arrow. But in terms of actually stating the direction of motion, it's going to be the velocity. So if they tell you to state what the direction of motion is, it's going to be like the actual velocity um, equation so whatever it is so state the direction of motion at r at t equals to one you're going to find the velocity and then substitute one into it and this is really important in terms of crossing versus colliding so crossing paths means that they can share the same x and y point but not at the same time whereas colliding is that they have the same x and y points at the exact same time so e i.e x1 equals to x2 when y1 equals to y2 whereas these ones they might not be necessarily at that point it's just that the actual equations cross so an example of this is if we said you know, so right so here right we scheduled a time to start this lecture and we said at this lecture on this website right so we collided because we were at the same place at the same time right you know and all of your peers who are listening to this as well you're at the same place at the same time whereas because this lecture is recorded you know you might be listening to this a couple of days on and you will be listening and then you'll be listening then but then somebody else will be listening a couple of days ago so you were at the same place but you're not at the same there at the same time so you would not have collided so when we talk about this, it's more in a physical sense. So I guess if you're talking about meeting up with a friend at school, you know, you meet up, you tell them a place and a time and you've collided because you're telling them the place and the time. So you're at the same place at the same time. Whereas if you're like, OK, we want to meet here, but nobody really specified what time you're going to meet. That means that you will have crossed past probably because you probably went past the same point, but it won't ever have been that you collided because you will never be at the same point at the exact same time. Okay, another thing here also that they ask a lot is about the shortest distance. And to find the shortest distance simply, we will just want to find the perpendicular to the curve and go straight there. So remember that with the dot products that if you dot product two perpendicular vectors, it equals to zero. So essentially, if we want to find that, all we have to do is convert the point that we want to talk about into a vector. And then we want to subtract that from the curve vector so subtract it from whatever this curve kind of is and then what we want to do is multiply that against the curve vector so we're saying essentially the distance vector here and then we want to multiply it by that curve vector and then what we want to do is solve that vector equals to zero 
because we want that vector to be the minimum distance possible so we want those two vectors to be perpendicular right so that's exactly what we're gonna get and essentially in terms of the actual distance formula so once you find exactly what it is then you can substitute it into this one to actually find what the actual distance per se is all right cool so we'll move on to vector projectile motion now and kind of talk a little bit about what happens there so it's very similar to the kinetics motion that we just talked about before in terms of what's going on and essentially it's the exact same thing except the only kind of minute difference to it is that you now have vectors being involved so it actually makes it easier because now you can resolve the vectors into two components rather than having to deal with both the vertical and the horizontal component as at once and before essentially what we did with kinematics is just like resolve it into two components um, rather than we, we kind of talked about you know this is the horizontal component this is the vertical component uh, but now what we're going to do instead is just kind of change it so instead it's going to be we can kind of simultaneously talk about the two things because we're just separating it by the i and j um, type thing so once we can do this right we will we will see that we'll be able to just essentially do the same thing so we start with acceleration and if we only have gravity here and if we have extra things acting on it we can do extra things if not you can still use the constant acceleration formulas except the only difference here is that instead of just solely using the constant acceleration formulas now you can kind of introduce the idea of vectors to that as well so these are a couple of laws that I just put in the slides for you to have a look at. Um, essentially, they're just the laws that you might come across in terms of your methods or your special. And they're just things that can come up. They should explain it to you in questions because technically it's not formally part of the study design anymore. Okay, um, and these are the forces that also might come up.